Okay, I think we're good. Um, here, hang on, let me bring this side up first just to make sure. Yeah, da, 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 da. Okay, so first off, everybody, anybody, if you're having any problems hearing me or whatever, please let me know. Um, so I will be aware. Oh, yeah, that's right. We're on a lag, aren't we? Oh, God, I don't know what to do about that. Anyway, um, well, we'll figure it out later on. So good to see you all. Uh, nice to be back, uh, although I was here at this slot last week it was the next night um when everything kind of went south so i am trying a new uh particularly i'm trying a new uh streaming software let's get rid of that trying a new steam streaming software steaming software um there now i've gone out of focus um okay audio's good hello hello okay good glad to hear that if i just sit here and stare for a minute maybe the uh the camera will figure me out again and go oh it's that weird blurry looking pink thing in the middle that's it um anyway it's been another crazy week um still working uh working on all kinds of stuff as usual um both you know the the stuff of daily life and um everything else uh, and of course, working on Navigator's Children, which uh, I'm now at one of the first, for lack of a better word, um, the kind of climaxes, or um, if we want to be a little less sexy, we, you know, say <laughs> one of the, uh, I don't know, what what, are we, what what does one call these things? They're, they're you know, they're these moments of it, intense stuff happening, and especially in the case of books like these, um, it's stuff that I've been planning to have happen in some cases for God, going on eight years now. So to finally get to these things and write them is really odd and strange and interesting um, because, of course, they're nothing like what you thought they were um, when you originally thought of them. They're, you know, quite different. Uh, some things have changed. Some things have gone uh, another direction entirely. I still don't know why now we've lost the focus here on the thing. Let me see if there's anything I can do here to fix that. No, that doesn't do anything. Use presets, use and done, okay. We'll just see if it comes back. I'll just sit here and stare at it for a minute and see. Um, I really hate messing, there we go. I really hate messing with this stuff. It's just boring. I just, all I want you know, it's the same reason that I wrote the Otherland books, by the way, and I think I've mentioned this before, so excuse me if I'm repeating myself. Um, but back in the uh, late 1980s when I was working at Apple and, and sort of really spent a lot of time um, going to lectures and expositions and things like that where all the kind of new, what was at the time called interactive multimedia. Um, was first being introduced and, you know, hypercard and hypertext and things like that. And I was fascinated by this stuff. But at the same time, I was very frustrated because it was obvious to me that most of this stuff was at least 20 years away. Um, and what I wanted to do, I, I'm not an engineer, you know, I'm a, I'm a creative, as they say in Hollywood. I'm a creative. And so what I wanted to do was mess with this stuff. You know, I wanted to... to make it work for me you know I wanted to take the the raw materials and use them to make things and ultimately that's what led to the other land books was me thinking well I'll just invent you know a time in the near future where all of this is possible and where virtuality can be utilized for story purposes on a grand scale and um, in the same sense or at least the same sort of impatience um, I am with streaming software you know I mean I'm sure there's a way I can throw money and time at it but I don't have either so I'm trying to make do with what I can but I just want it to work you know I'm as I said I'm not an engineer I'm not you know when I was at, at working at Apple I was working as a writer and then kind of as a, a, a you know somebody who was kind of specializing in technical information kind of a librarian in a sense and all that and that's all I want I just want to work with the stuff not invent the stuff, not perfect the stuff, not fix the stuff when it breaks. <laughs> I want to use the stuff. So we'll see if this works better than the last uh, 
We'll see if this works better than the last iteration. And if not, we'll try something else. So anyway, um, so what else is there to report? Yeah, we're just, you know, we're in the middle of a lot of crazy stuff at the moment. Nothing particularly bad or anything, just really super busy. We're trying to do a lot of stuff to the house for complicated reasons. Um, and, but this seems to be the time. So that's going on and trying, oh God, you know, just messing with just the daily life that you all know very well. You know, no matter what country you're in, if you live in the modern world, you're messing with the same kind of crap that I'm messing with all the time. You know, it's went to go get the, 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 our, one of our kids is taking a driving test. And so, you know, realized that the, uh, the car was coming up for, um, registration, which in America, you know, you have to get your car registered every year. I'm sure it's true in Europe and Australia and also, but anyway, so, you know, went down to do that and they said, oh, but it's not, it's not smog. Didn't you get the smog thing? Went, no, didn't get that. Went back, hunted around the house, eventually found the smog thing, realized that we had the wrong plate number on our registration. And I've had it for several years because I hadn't had to smog the car. In other words, I hadn't had to go out and have the, uh, the uh, exhaust system ch tested. You know, it's not something you have to do every year. So, but I realized that somewhere along the line, back when the thing first got transferred into our name, that it, we had the wrong license plate number. So they didn't match what was actually on the car. And, you know, so anyway, it's just gone on and on for weeks. And then I went, finally went in to get it smog, got that straightened away and the license plate problems and all that and got the, somebody to smog it. And it turned out I had mice underneath the hood and they had chewed through the air and oh my god and so you know now I have to, had to order special parts and all of this and and you know meanwhile we've already missed one driver's license test that we had scheduled because they wouldn't let us do it without an up-to-date registration so anyway I mentioned this not because if it's any uh, any particular interest because I'm sure all of you deal with things like this all the time um, but that's just the point, you know, I'm desperate to be working and desperate to be finishing up this stuff that's important in my life and my career and my family not starving and living in an underpass somewhere. And at the same time, you know, it's just like every single little thing you want to do turns into 48 other things that you have to do. So that's been my life pretty much the last three months or more. Um, and every now and then I find a few minutes to actually work on my books and the other things I have to do for a living. You know, I have a bunch of pages somebody has sent me to get signed for books, and they're just sitting there on the table because every day I come down and say, oh, yeah, I got to do those later today, and then some other emergency blows up or the plumbing stops working or, you know, or, you know the dog escapes or... Anyway, so no real complaints, nothing really bad in life at the moment, just, just constant distraction and craziness of daily life in the information age um, and you know that's just how it is and, and it is that way for everybody so I'm not putting this across to some putting this across as some special thing to relate to all of you and poor Tad um, everybody deals with this nonsense if we live in these bureaucratized societies and you're trying to get anything done or even if you're not trying to get anything done even if you're just trying to get everybody to leave you alone Anyway, so let me check in and see who's here. Oh, and the first thing I can see is it appears to be Wouter's birthday. So happy birthday, Wouter. Um, Ronnie, uh, the reason I know that is because Ronnie's checked in to say happy birthday to him. And so hi, good morning, Ronnie. Good morning, Mark. Good to see you, Andre. Great to see you too. Pleasure. Olaf, hello, my friend. Kristen, hello, Paul Rogerson, hello, good to see you too, um, and I am glad you're with us. Tom, hello, hello, greetings from Poland, oh cool, I, I'm not wearing any of my Polish stuff tonight, I am wearing my Czech t-shirt from a Czech science fiction fantasy magazine called Pewnost, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Pewnost, um, so... That's the closest to the Eastern European tie-in I can get at the moment. And I do absolutely realize that Poland and the Czech Republic are two very different places. So don't think I'm saying, oh, you know, Eastern Europe, they're all the same. 
I've actually been to Poland and I've actually been to the Czech Republic and had a lovely time in both. But I am most aware that they are different countries. So anyway, good to see you, Tom. Thank you for the greetings. Iris, hello, hello. Um, Voucher is frying up his birthday breakfast. Well, that's a good thing to be doing on your birthday. So congratulations to, to uh, Voucher and good to see you, Iris. Anamika, hello, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Holger, hello. Oh, and Holger's been doing doing good son duty for his mom, he says. All right, excellent, excellent. Um, and who else is here? Ronnie. Did we say hello to Ronnie already? No, I don't think so. Well, anyway, even if I did, it, yes, I did, because Ronnie was the first one in the list, but it doesn't matter. It does not matter. It's always good to see everybody again, even if they get said hello to twice. Jessica, hello, hello. Good to see you. Stephen, checking in from Tynemouth on the northeast coast of England. Tyne and Weir know the area well. Many friends from that part of the country. Um, you guys know that I used to live in England. Not that long, only about three years. But of course, my wife is English. Her family is English. Here's my mother-in-law, Hazel, checking in. Hello, sweetie. Love and kisses to you. We're all doing okay here. Rob, Tad, do you think Otherland is your best work or something else? That's as... I think, again, I've said, I've been talking now for so many years, I've said almost everything 40 times, but for those who haven't heard me say it, it's, it's very hard. I mean, people have compared choosing a favorite book for a writer to choosing a favorite child for a parent, um, you know, because you love them all in different ways based on what you were trying to do, where you were trying to, to get to. Um, what you managed to do, what point in your career were you doing it, you know, I mean, all these other kinds of factors. I know what I'm probably best known for are the Ostinard books, of which we're going to be reading The Dragonbone Chair tonight. Um, and in some ways, of course, that's the one that the, the, the world in which I have most deeply participated. On the other hand, other books have their own fondness for me deeply. Um, some of them are more autobiographical than others. Um, the War of the Flowers and the Bobby Dollar books are much more like me as a person, the protagonists. Um, and, uh, you know, and so it ta Tail Chaser Song was my first. You know, all these things have different resonances. That said, in some ways, I think Otherland is my favorite personally just because I got to show, I think, the most of what I can do, um, both imagination-wise and different kinds of writing and very different kinds of characters. And there's a lot of humor in it and social and political commentary and a lot of things like that. So in some ways, yeah. I mean, I would say that the Otherland is kind of the book I look on as being the the most of a, sh a showroom piece, a master piece, not, I hasten to say, in the sense that I'm proclaiming it a masterpiece in the common usage of the word, um, but in the old-fashioned word usage, which was that when somebody was an apprentice and they would go to work for a goldsmith or a um, master weaver or a sculptor or whatever, you know, and they would go to learn the trade or the art. And before they could leave their apprenticeship and become a master themselves, they had to do their masterpiece. Um, that's my understanding of where the word comes from. And that was to say, here, I have proved that I am now, you know, on a level with the other people who are making their living. I am no longer just an apprentice. And in that sense, you know, I think that Otherland was kind of my master piece in that I was able to show the broadest s scope of what I can do, if that makes sense. So I'm, it, I'm still very, very fond of it, and, and, and that's the reason. Okay, who have I not said hello to yet? We've checked in. We got Rob. Alexis! Alexis, making loud noises and a dinosaur squeal. Oh, and there's my lovely sister-in-law, Lisa. Hello, good morning, sweetie. Um, no, this is not a Q&A. Kristen asked if this is a Q&A night. You can always put a question in the um, comments, and if I see it, I will try to answer it tonight. 
But this is actually a reading night, and that's what I'm going to do. So um, I'm going to read the chapter that the folks on last Sunday evening, my time, should have got to hear, but didn't because the audio went kablooey. So instead, I am going to read it now, and then they will get chapter 3 at 7 p.m. They, meaning whichever ones of you happen to be out there. I didn't see a check-in from Ilva, but my friend Ilva is recovering from health issues, and Ilva, as I've mentioned many, many times, is also one of the people who's been super important in the uh, work on the new Ostinard books. So many of you talked to her here uh, during the readings and things like that, and as far as I know from when we talked a couple days ago, she's doing much better, but um, I'm sure she would appreciate your thoughts um, and and, uh, and and greetings, because I think she's probably checked. Your, if she's not literally watching right this moment, she will be watching at some point. So anyway, so lots of love to you, sweetie, and and hope you're continuing to do better. Okay, so we're going back to this very old book, The Dragon Bone Chair, which... It's so funny now. I mean, like, large chunks of my audience were probably not even born when this book originally came out in, what was it, 1988? 1988. 1988. Damn, that was the last year of uh, the Ronald Reagan administration. So we're talking a long time ago in America. Um, not sure things are better. <laughs> They couldn't have been much worse than they were in 1988. But then again, you know, hold my beer. We'll, we may still find out that, that things can be worse still. But as I always say, this is not a slot that I use to talk politics, however dreary and depressing politics may be at the moment. This is about reading. So now I'm going to read. So back to the Dragon Bone Chair. This is Chapter 2, A Two-Frog Story. An idle mind is the devil's seed bed. Simon reflected ruefully on this, one of Rachel's favorite expressions as he stared down at the display of horse armor, which now lay scattered the length of the chaplain's walking hall. A moment before, he had been leaping happily down the long tiled hallway, which ran along the outer length of the chapel, on his way to sweep Dr. Morganis's chambers. He had been waving the broom about a little, of course, pretending it was the tree and drake flag of Prester John's Urkengard, and that he was leading them into battle. Perhaps he should have been paying better heed to where he was waggling it. But what sort of idiot would hang a suit of horse armor in the chaplain's hallway anyway? Needless to say, the clatter had been ferocious, and Simon expected skinny, vengeful Father Dreosin to descend at any minute. Hurrying to gather up the dingy armor plate, some of which had torn loose from the leather straps that bound the suit together, Simon considered another of Rachel's maxims, the devil finds chores for empty hands. That was silly, of course, and made him angry. It was not the emptiness of his hands or the idleness of his thoughts that got him into trouble. No, it was the doing and the thinking that tripped him up time and time again. If only they would leave him alone. Father Dreosin had still not made an entrance by the time he at last worried the armor into a precarious stack, then hastily pushed it behind the skirt of a table rug. In doing so, he nearly upset the golden reliquary seated on the tabletop. But at last, and with no further mishaps, the sundered armor was gone from view and with nothing but a slightly cleaner-looking patch on the wall to proclaim that the suit had ever existed at all. Simon picked up his broom and scuffed away at the sooty stone, trying to even up the edges so that the bright spot was not so noticeable, then hurried on down the hall and out past the winding choir loft stairs. Emerging once more into the hedge garden, from which he had been so brutally abducted by Rachel the dragon, Simon halted for a moment to inhale the pungent smell of greenery, to drive the last of the tallow soap stench from his nostrils. His eye was caught by an unusual shape in the upper branches of the festival oak, 
an ancient tree at the far end of the garden, so gnarled and convoluted of branch that it looked as though it had grown for centuries beneath the giant bushel basket. He squinted, hand raised to block the slanting sunlight. A bird's nest, and so late in the year. It was a very near thing. He had dropped the broom and taken several steps into the garden before he remembered his mission to Morganes. If it had been any other errand, he would have been up the tree in an instant, but getting to see the doctor was a treat even when it entailed work. He promised himself that the nest would not remain long unexamined and passed on through the hedges and into the courtyard before the inner bailey gate. Two figures had just entered the gate and were coming toward him, one slow and stumpy, the other stumpier and slower still. It was Jacob, the chandler, and his assistant, Jeremias. The latter was carrying a large, heavy-looking bag over his shoulder and walking, if such was possible, more sluggishly than usual. Simon called a greeting as they passed. Jacob smiled and waved. Rachel wants new candles for the dining room, the chandler shouted. So candles she gets. Jeremias made a sour face. A short trot down the sloping greensward brought Simon to the massive gatehouse. A sliver of afternoon sun still smoldered above the battlements behind him, and the shadows of the pennants on the western wall flopped like dark fish on the grass. The red and white liveried guard, scarcely older than Simon, smiled and nodded as the master spy pounded past, deadly broom in hand, head held low in case the tyrant Rachel should happen to peep from one of the keep's high windows. Once through the barbican, and hidden in the lee of the high gate wall, he slowed to a walk. Green Angel Tower's attenuated shadow bridged the moat. The distorted silhouette of the angel, triumphant on her spire, lay in a pool of fire at the water's farthest edge. As long as he was here, Simon decided, he might as well catch some frogs. It shouldn't take too long, and the doctor frequently had use for such things. It wouldn't really be putting off the errand so much as expanding the nature of the service. He would have to hurry, though. Evening was coming on swiftly. Already he could hear the crickets laboriously tuning up for what would be one of the waning year's last performances, and the bullfrogs beginning their muffled, clunking counterpoint. Wading out into the lily-crusted water, Simon paused for a moment to listen and to watch the eastern sky darkening to a dull violet. Next to Dr. Morganis's chambers, the moat was his favorite spot in all creation. All of it that he had seen so far, anyway. With an unconscious sigh, he pulled off his shapeless cloth hat and sloshed along toward where the pond grass and hyacinths were thickest. The sun had completely vanished, and the wind was hissing through the cattails ringing the moat by the time Simon had reached the middle bailey to stand, clothes a drip and a frog in each pocket before the door of Morganes's chambers. He knocked on the stout paneling, careful not to touch the unfamiliar symbol chalked on the wood. He had learned by hard experience not to carelessly lay hands on something of the doctor's without asking. Several moments passed before Morganes' voice was heard. Go away, it said in a tone of annoyance. It's me, Simon, called Simon and knocked again. There was a longer pause this time than the sound of rapid footfalls. The door swung open. Morganes, whose head barely reached Simon's chin, stood framed in bright blue light, the expression on his face obscured. For a moment, he seemed to stare. What? He said finally. Who? Simon laughed. Me, of course. Do you want some frogs? He pulled one of the captives from its prison and held it up by a slippery leg. Oh! Oh! The doctor seemed to be coming awake, as from a deep sleep. He shook his head. Simon, but naturally... Come in, boy. 
My apologies, I am a little distracted. He opened the door wide enough for Simon to slip past him into the narrow inner hallway, then pulled it close again. Frogs, is it? Hmm, frogs? The doctor angled past and led him along the corridor. In the glow of the blue lamps that lined the hall, the doctor's spindly form, monkey-like, seemed to bound instead of walk. Simon followed, his shoulders nearly touching the cold stone walls on either side. He could never understand how rooms that seemed as small as the doctors did from the outside, he had looked down on them from the Bailey walls and paced the distance in the courtyard, how they could have such long corridors. Simon's musings were interrupted by a hideous eruption of noise echoing down the passageway, whistles, bangs, and something that sounded like the hungry baying of a hundred hounds. Morganes jumped in surprise and said, Oh, name of a name, I forgot to snuff the candles. Wait here. The small man hurried down the hallway, wispy white hair fluttering, pulled the door at the end open just a crack. The howling and whistling doubled its intensity and slipped quickly inside. Simon heard a muffled shout. The horrendous noise abruptly ceased, as quickly and completely as as the snuffing of a candle, Simon thought. The doctor poked his head out, smiled, and beckoned him in. Simon, who had witnessed scenes of this type before, followed Morganes cautiously into his workshop. A hasty entrance could at the very least cause one to step on something strange and unpleasant to contemplate. There was now not a trace of whatever had set up that fearful yammering. Simon again marveled at the discrepancy between what Morgenes's room seemed to be, a converted guard barracks, perhaps twenty paces in length, nestled against the ivy-tangled wall of the Middle Bailey's northeastern corner, and the view inside, which was of a low-ceiling but spacious chamber almost as long as a tournament field, although not nearly so wide. In the orange light that filtered down from the long row of small windows overlooking the courtyard, Simon peered at the farthest end of the room and decided he would be hard-pressed to hit it with a stone from the doorway in which he stood. This curious stretching effect, however, was quite familiar. In fact, despite the terrifying noises, the whole chamber seemed much as it usually did, as though a horde of crack-brained peddlers had set up shop and then made a hasty retreat during a wild windstorm. The long refectory table that spanned the length of the near wall was littered with fluted glass, tubes, boxes, and cloth sacks of powders and pungent salts, as well as intricate structures of wood and metal from which depended retorts and files and other recognizable containers. The centerpiece of the table was a great brazen ball with tiny angled spouts protruding from its shiny skin. It seemed to float in a dish of silvery liquid, the both of them balanced at the apex of a carved ivory tripod. The spouts chuffed steam, and the brass globe slowly evolved. The floor and shelves were littered with even stranger articles. Polished stone blocks and brooms and leather wings were strewn across the flagstones, vying for space with animal cages, some empty, some not, metal armatures of unknown creatures covered with ragged pelts or mismatched feathers, sheets of seemingly clear crystal stacked haphazardly against the tapestried walls, and everywhere books, 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 dropped halfway open or propped upright here and there about the chamber like huge clumsy butterflies. There were also glass balls of colored liquids that bubbled without heat and a flat box of glittering black sand that rearranged itself endlessly as if, a, as if swept by unfelt desert breezes. Wooden cabinets on the wall from time to time disgorged painted wooden birds who cheeped impertinently and disappeared. Beside these hung maps of countries with totally unfamiliar geography, although 
Admittedly, geography was not something Simon felt too confident about. Taken all together, the doctor's lair was a paradise for a curious young man. Without doubt, the most wonderful place in Ostenard. Morganes had been pacing about in the far corner of the room beneath a drooping star chart that linked the bright celestial points together by painted line to make the shape of an odd four-winged bird. With a little whistle of triumph, the doctor suddenly leaned down and began to dig like a squirrel in spring. A flurry of scrolls, brightly painted flannels, and miniature flatware and goblets from some homunculate supper table rose in the air behind him. At last, he straightened up, hefting a large glass-sided box. He waded to the table, set the glass cube down, and picked a pair of flasks out of a rack, apparently, at random. The liquid in one of them was the color of sunset of the sunset skies outside. It smoked like a censer. The other was full of something blue and viscous, which flowed ever so slowly down into the box as Morganes upended the two flasks. Mixing, the fluids turned as clear as mountain air. The doctor threw his hand out like a traveling performer, and there was a moment's pause. Frogs? Morganes asked, waggling his fingers. Simon rushed forward, pulling the two he had caught out of his coat pockets. The doctor took them and dropped them into the tank with a flourish. The pair of surprised amphibians plunked into the transparent liquid, sank slowly to the bottom, then began to swim vigorously about in their new home. Simon laughed with as much surprise as amusement. Is it water? The old man turned to look at him with bright eyes. More or less, more or less. So, now Morganes dragged long bent fingers through his sparse fringe of beard. So, thank you for the frogs. I think I knew what to do with them already. I think I know what to do with them already. Quite painless. They may even enjoy it, although uh, I doubt they'll like wearing the boots. Boots? wondered Simon. But the doctor was off and bustling again, this time pushing a stack of maps from a low stool. He beckoned Simon to sit. Well then, young man, what will you take as due coin for your day's work? A fiving piece? Or perhaps you would like cooking dryless here for a pet? Chuckling, the doctor brandished a mummified lizard. Simon hesitated for a moment over the lizard. It would be a lovely thing to slip into the linen basket for the new girl Hepzibah to discover. But no, the thought of the chambermaids and cleaning stuck in his mind, irritating him. Something wanted to be remembered, but Simon pushed it back. No, he said at last. I like to hear some stories. Stories? Morganes bent forward quizzically. Stories? You would be much better off going to old Shem horse groom in the stables if you want to hear such things. Not that kind, Simon said hastily. He hoped he hadn't offended the little man. Old people were so sensitive. Stories about real things, how things used to be, battles, dragons, things that happened. Ah, Morgane sat up and the smile returned to his pink face. I see, you mean history. The doctor rubbed his hands. That's better, much better. He sprang to his feet and began pacing, stepping nimbly over the oddments scattered about the floor. Well, what do you want to hear about, lad? The fall of Narved? The battle of Ox Samrath? Tell me about the castle, Simon said. The hayhole. Did the king build it? How old is it? The castle. The doctor stopped pacing, plucked up a corner of his worn, shiny gray robe, and began to rub absently at one of Simon's favorite curiosities, a suit of armor exotically designed and colored in wildflower bright blues and yellows, made entirely from polished wood. Hmm. The castle, Morganes repeated. 
Well, that's certainly a two-frog story at the very least. Actually, if I were to tell you the whole story, you would have to drain the moat and bring your warty prisoners in by the cartload to pay for it. But it is the bare bones of the tale that I think you want today, and I can certainly give you that. Hold yourself still for a moment while I find something to wet my throat. As Simon tried to sit quietly, Morgenius went to his long table and picked up a beaker of brown, frothy liquid. He sniffed it suspiciously, brought it to his lips, and downed a small gulp. After a moment of consideration, he licked his bare upper lip and pulled his beard happily. Ah, the stancher dark. No doubt on the subject, ale is the stuff. What were we talking about then? Ah, yes, the castle. Morgenius cleared a place on the table and then, holding his flask carefully, vaulted up with surprising ease to sit, slippered feet dangling half a cubit above the floor. He sipped again. I'm afraid this story starts long before our King John. We shall begin with the first men and women to come to Ostenard, simple folk living on the banks of the Glenwent. They were mostly herdsmen and fisherfolk, perhaps driven out from the lost west over some land bridge that no longer exists. They caused little trouble for the masters of Ostenard, but I thought you said they were the first to come here, Simon interrupted, secretly pleased he had caught Morgenes in a contradiction. No, I said they were the first men. The Scythi held this land long before any man walked on it. You mean there really were little folk? Simon grinned. Just like Shem Horsegroom tells of, the pukas and niskis and all? This was exciting. Morgane shook his head vigorously and took another swallow. Not only were, are although that jumps ahead of my narrative, and they are by no means little folk. Wait, lad, let me go on. Simon hunched forward and tried to look patient. Yes? Well, as I mentioned, the men and Scythi were peaceful neighbors. True, there was an occasional dispute over grazing land or some such, but since mankind seemed no real threat, the fair folk were generous. As time went on, men began to build cities, sometimes only a half day's walk from Scythi lands. Later still, a great kingdom arose on the rocky peninsula of Naban, and the mortal men of Ostenard began to look there for guidance. Are you still following my trail, boy? Simon nodded. Good. A long draft. Well, the land seemed quite big enough for all to share, until Black Iron came over the water. What? Black Iron? Simon was immediately stilled by the doctor's sharp look. The shipmen out of the near-forgotten west, the Rimmersmen, Morganes continued, they landed in the north, armed men, fierce as bears, riding in their long serpent boats. The Rimmersmen? Simon wondered. Like Duke is Grimner at the court? On boats? They were great seafarers before they settled here, the Duke's ancestors, Morganes affirmed. But when they first came, they were not searching for grazing or farming land, but for plunder. Most importantly, though, they brought iron, or at least the secret of shaping it. They made iron swords and spears, weapons that would not break like the bronze of Ostenard, weapons that could beat down even the witch wood of the Scythi. Morgenes rose and refilled his beaker from a covered bucket, standing on a cathedral of books beside the wall. Instead of returning to the table, he stopped to finger the shiny epaulets of the armor suit. 
None stood against them for long. The cold, hard spirit of the iron seemed in the shipmen themselves as much as in their blades. Many folk fled south, moving closer to the protection of Naban's frontier outposts. The Nabanai legions, well-organized garrison forces, resisted for a while. Finally, they too were forced to abandon the frost march to the Rimmersmen. There was... there was much slaughter. Simon squirmed happily. What about the Scythi? You said they had no iron? It was deadly to them. The doctor licked his finger and rubbed away a spot on the polished wood of the breastplate. Even they could not defeat the Rimmersmen in open battle, but, he pointed the dusty finger at Simon as if this fact concerned him personally, but the Scythi knew their land. They were close to it, a part of it even, in a way that the invaders could never be. They held their own for a long time, falling slowly back on places of strength. The chiefest of these, and the reason for this whole discourse, was Azwa, the Hayhold. This castle? The Scythi lived in the Hayhold? Simon was unable to keep the disbelief out of his voice. How long ago was it built? Simon, Simon, the doctor scratched his ear and returned to his perch on the table. The sunset was completely gone from the windows, and the torchlight divided his face into a mummer's mask, half illumined, half dark. There may, for all I or any mortal can know, have been a castle here when the Scythi first came, when Ostenard was as new and unsullied as a snowmelt brook. Scythi folk certainly dwelled here countless years before man arrived. This was the first place in Ostern Ard to feel the work of crafting hands. It is the stronghold of the country commanding the waterways, riding herd on the finest croplands. The Hayholt and its predecessors, the older citadels that lie buried beneath us, have stood here since before the memories of mankind. It was... Very, very old when the Rimmersmen came. Simon's mind whirled as the enormity of Morganes's statement seeped in. The old castle seemed suddenly oppressive, its rock walls a cage. He shuddered and looked quickly around as though some ancient jealous thing might even at this moment be reaching out for him with dusty hands. Morganes laughed merrily a very young laugh from so old a man, and hopped down from the table. The torches seemed to glow a little brighter. Fear not, Simon. I think, uh, and I of all people should know, that there is not much for you to fear from Scythi magic. Not today. The castle has been much changed. Stone laid over stone, and every L has been rigorously blessed by a hundred priests. Oh, Judith and the cooking staff may turn around from time to time and find a plate of cakes missing, but I think that can be as logically ascribed to young men as to goblins. The doctor was interrupted by a short series of raps upon the chamber door. Who is it? he cried. It's me, said a doleful voice. There was a long pause. Me, inch, it finished. Bones of Anaxos, swore the doctor, who favored exotic expressions. Open the door, then. I am too old to run about waiting on fools. The door swung inward. The man framed against the glow of the inner hallway in such a way that it was... The man framed against the glow of the inner hallway was probably tall, but hung his head and hunched his body forward in such a way that it was difficult to make sure. A round, vacant face floated like a moon just above his breastbone, thatched by spiky black hair that had been cut with a dull and clumsy knife. Uh, I'm sorry I, I bothered you, Doctor, 
But you said come early now, didn't you? The voice was thick and slow as dripping lard. Morgenes gave a whistle of exasperation and tugged on a coil of his own white hair. Yes, I did, but I said early after the dinner hour, which has not yet arrived. Still no sense in sending you away. Simon, have you met Inch, my assistant? Simon nodded politely. He had seen the man once or twice. Morgenes had him come in some evenings to help, apparently with heavy lifting. It certainly wouldn't be for anything else, since Inch did not look as though he could be trusted to piss on the fire before going to bed. Well, young Simon, I'm afraid that will have to put an end to my windiness for the day, the old man said. Since Inch is here, I must use him. Come back soon, and I will tell you more, if you like. Certainly. Simon nodded once more to Inch, who rolled a cow-like gaze after him. He had reached the door, almost touched it, when, sudden, when a sudden vision blazed into life in his head. A clear picture of Rachel's broom lying where he had left it on the grass beside the moat, like the corpse of a strange water bird. Mooncalf! He would say nothing. He could collect the broom on his way back and tell the dragon that the chore was finished. She had so much to think about, and although she and the doctor were two of the castle's oldest residents, they seldom spoke. It was obviously the best plan. Without understanding why, Simon turned back. The little man was scrutinizing a curling scroll bent over the table while Inch stood behind him, staring at nothing in particular. Dr. Morgenes. At the sound of his name, the doctor looked up, blinking. He seemed surprised that Simon was still in the room. <coughs> Excuse me. He seemed surprised that Simon was still in the room. Simon was surprised, too. Doctor, I've been a fool. Morgenes arched his eyebrows, waiting. I was supposed to to sweep your room. Rachel asked me to. Now the whole afternoon has gone by. Ah, ah. Morganes' nose wrinkled as if it itched him. Then he broke out a wide smile. Sweep my chamber, eh? Well, lad, come back tomorrow and do it. Tell Rachel that I have more work for you, if she will be so good as to let you go. He turned back to his book again, then looked up once more, eyes narrowing, and pursed his lips. As the doctor sat in silent thought, the elation Simon was feeling changed suddenly to nervousness. Why is he staring at me like that? Come to think of it, boy, the man finally said. I will be having many chores coming up that you could help me with. And eventually I will need an apprentice. Come back tomorrow, as I said. I will talk with the mistress of chambermaids about the other. He smiled briefly, then turned back to his scroll. Simon was suddenly aware that Inch was staring across the doctor's back at him, an unreadable expression moving beneath the placid surface of his way-colored face. Simon turned and sprinted through the door, Exhilaration caught him up as he bounded down the blue-lit hallway and emerged under dark, cloud-smeared skies. Apprentice! To the doctor! When he reached the gatehouse, he stopped and climbed down to the edge of the moat to look for the broom. The crickets were well into the evening's corral. When he found it at last, he sat down for a moment against the wall near the water's brink to listen. As the rhythmic song rose around him, he ran his fingers along the nearby stones, caressing the surface of one worn as smooth as hand-burnished cedar, he thought, this stone may have been standing here since, since before our Lord Eusiris was born. Perhaps some Sith boy once sat here in this same quiet place, listening to the night. Where did that breeze come from? A voice seemed to whisper, 
whisper, the words too faint to hear. Perhaps he ran his hands over this same stone, a whisper on the wind. We will have it back, man-child. We will have it all back. Clutching the neck of his coat tight against the unexpected chill, Simon got up and climbed the grassy slope, suddenly lonesome for familiar voices and light. And that was the end of chapter two. I'll start a little bit of chapter three. Um, just since we're, yes, just since we're, we've still got about 10 minutes to go. So chapter three, birds in the chapel. By the blessed Adon, whack, and Elijah his mother, whack, whack, and all the saints that watch over, whack, watch over, ouch, a hiss of frustration, damned spiders. The whacking resumed, curses and invocations laid on between. Rachel was cleaning cobwebs from the dining hall ceiling. Two girls sick and another with a twisted ankle. This was the kind of day that put a dangerous glint in Rachel the dragon's agate eye. Bad enough to have Sarah and Jael down with the fluxion. Rachel was a hard taskmistress, but she knew that every day of working a sick girl could mean losing her three days in the longer run. Yes, bad enough that Rachel had to pick up the slack left by their absence, as if she did not do two people's work already. Now the seneschal said the king would dine in the great hall tonight, and Elias, the prince regent, had arrived from Merriment, and there was even more work to do. And Simon, sent off an hour before to pick a few bundles of rushes, was still not back. So here she stood with her tired old body, perched on a rickety stool, trying to get the spider webs out of the ceiling's high corners with a broom. That boy! That that holy Adon give strength. Whack, whack, whack. That damnable boy. It was not enough, Rachel reflected later as she slumped, red-faced and sweaty on the stool, that the boy was lazy and difficult. She had done her best over the years to thump the contrariness out of him. He was certainly a better person for it, she knew. No, by the good mother of God, what was worse was that no one else seemed to care. Simon was man-tall, and at an age when he should be doing nearly a man's work, but no, he hid and slid and mooned about. The kitchen workers laughed at him. The chambermaids coddled him and snuck dinner to him when she, Rachel, had banished him from the table. And Morganes, merciful Elijah, the man actually encouraged him. And now he had asked Rachel if the boy could come and work for him every day, sweeping up, helping to keep things clean, ha, and assisting the old man with some of his work, as if she didn't know better. The two of them would sit about the old souse guzzling ale and telling the boy heaven knew what kind of devil's stories. Still, she couldn't help considering his offer. It was the first time anyone had asked for the boy or wanted him at all. He was so underfoot all the time, and Morganes had really seemed to think he could do the boy some good. The doctor often irritated Rachel with his fancy talk and his flowery speeches, which the mistress of chambermaids felt sure were disguised mockery but he did seem to care about the boy. He had always kept an eye out for what was best for Simon, a, a suggestion here, an idea there, a quiet intercession once when the master of scullions had thrashed him and banished him from the kitchens. Morganes had always kept a watch on the boy. Rachel looked up at the broad beams of the ceiling, her gaze traveling off into the shadows. She blew a strand of damp hair off of her face. Starting back on that rainy night, she thought, 
What was it, almost 15 years ago? She felt so old thinking back this way. It seemed only a moment. The rain had been sheeting down all day and night. As Rachel went gingerly across the muddy courtyard, holding her cloak over her head with one hand, the lantern in the other, she stepped in a wide wagon rut and felt the water splash her calves. Her foot came free with a sucking sound, but without a shoe. She cursed bitterly and hurried forward. She would catch her death running around on such a night with one foot bare, but there was no time to go digging about in puddles. A light was burning in Morganis's study, but it seemed to take forever for the footsteps to come. When he opened the door, she saw that he had been abed. He wore a long nightshirt in need of mending and rubbed his eyes groggily in the lantern glare. The tangled blankets of his bed, surrounded by a leaning palisade of books in the room's far corner, made Rachel think of some foul animal's nest. Doctor, come quick, she said. You must come quick, now. Morgane stared, then stepped back. Come in, Rachel. I have no idea what nocturnal palpitations have brought you, but since you are here... No, no, you foolish man, it's Susanna. Her time is here, but she's very weak. I'm afraid for her. Who? Uh, what? Never mind, then. Just a moment. Let me get my things. What a dreadful night. Go on. I shall catch up to you. But, Dr. Morganis, I brought the lantern for you. Too late. The door was closed, and she was alone on the step with rain dribbling off her long nose. Cursing, she splashed back to the servants' quarters. It was not long before Morganis was stamping up the stairs, shaking the water from his cloak. At the doorway, he absorbed the scene in a single glance. A woman on the bed, with her face turned away, big with child and groaning. Dark hair lay across her face, and she squeezed in a sweaty fist the hand of another young woman who kneeled beside her. At the foot of the bed, Rachel stood with an older woman. The old one stepped toward Morganes while he shed his bulky outer clothing. Hello, Elspeth he said quietly. How does it look? Not good, I'm afraid, sir. You know I could have dealt with it otherwise. She's been trying for hours, and she's bleeding. Her heart is very faint. As Elspeth spoke, Rachel moved nearer. Hmm. Morganes bent and rummaged in the sack he had brought. Give her some of this, please he said, handling Rachel a stoppered vial. Just a swallow, but mind she gets it. He returned to searching his bag as Rachel gently pried open the clenched, trembling jaw of the woman on the bed and poured a little of the liquid into her mouth. The odor of sweat and blood that suffused the room was suddenly supplemented by a pungent, spicy scent. A doctor... Elspeth was saying as Rachel returned, I don't think we can save both mother and child, if we can even save one. You must save the child's life, Rachel interrupted. That's the duty of the God-fearing. The priest says so. Save the child. Morganes turned to look at her, turned to her with a look of annoyance. My good woman, I will fear God in my own way, if you don't mind. If I save her, and I do not pretend to know I can, then she can always have another child. No, she can't, Rachel said hotly. Her husband's dead. Morganis of all people should know that, she thought. Susanna's fisherman husband had often visited the doctor before he drowned, although what they might have had to talk about, Rachel could not imagine. Well, Morganis said distractedly, she can always find another... What? Her, her husband? A startled look came to his face, and he hurried to the bedside. He seemed to finally realize who it was lying there, bleeding her life out on the rough sheet. Susanna? He asked quietly, and turned the woman's fearful, 
pain-clenched face toward him. Her eyes opened wide for a moment as she saw him, then another wave of agony shut them again. Oh, what has happened here? Morgane sighed. Susanna could, only, Susanna could only moan, and the doctor looked up and Rachel and Elspeth with anger on his face. Why didn't anyone inform me that this poor girl was ready to bear a child? She was not due for two months more, Elspeth said gently. You know that. We are as surprised as you. And why should you care that a fisherman's widow was going to have a baby, Rachel said. She could be angry, too. And why are you arguing about it now? Morgane stared at her for a moment, then blinked twice. You are absolutely correct, he said, and turned back to the bed. I will save the child, Susanna, he told the shivering woman. She nodded her head once, then cried out. And I think we're going to stop there, since it's just a little after two. And I have a bookmark in place, so I can pick it up again on seven o'clock. So, we seem to have gone through all tonight without anybody saying that the sound was screwed up. So, good. We'll hope that that means all worked out as it should. Um, I, I, I could actually see myself moving instead of losing the... Um, Losing the picture partway through, which has been happening to me with the other software. So we'll hang on to this for now and see how everything is going and uh, we'll keep using it. So anyway, thank you for being the human guinea pigs for this little experiment with the new software. And as always, I thank you also for joining me, which is um, super super useful and super important to me. Um, and uh, this whole reading thing because you know it's like if I write and nobody reads it am I really writing and if I read and nobody's listening am I really reading and these are the kind of conundrums that keep people like me awake at night long past the point where we should just give up and go to bed anyway so take good care of yourselves please I will be back 7 p.m. to do my next reading and then I will be back this time or 1 a.m. my time next week where we will be continuing with the dragon bone chair until that point take good care of yourselves take good care of your loved ones take good care of your friends and neighbors and anybody that uh, looks like they need help at least check and see how they're doing and i will talk to you soon so again thank you so much for joining me ciao peace choose bye